Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel on ThinkTech, and this is Energy in America. And we are joined by Lucien um, uh, Pugliarisi, who is the CEO of EPRINC, which is an energy research, energy policy research think tank in Washington, D.C. Welcome back to the show, Lucien. It's great to have you here. Good to be here, Jay. You look great, by the way. Thanks. Anyway, so uh, I, we're going to name this uh, what you need to know about uh, high octane. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's important that we know about high octane. And this yeah. all trips off a, a paper that you presented Monday, Tuesday, in this big energy conference in Washington, attended by vir virtually thousands of people. Yeah. Um, and you presented this paper to tell them about octane, high octane. Uh, of course, it's related. It means it's a somewhat boring topic, I agree, except uh, when you show up at the pump and the numbers are expensive. So let's sort of do, do the background to this. In the uh, uh, about the time that the we went into the Great Recession and the auto industry was in a massive tailspin. In fact, I have a a short video sometime I should find for you where they have brand new Chryslers in a church, and the pastor is praying for the auto industry. You know that's how dire it was in Detroit, <laughs> and as part of the bailout of the auto industry at the very beginning of the Obama administration. The auto industry signed up for, which, which has turned out to be very uh, arduous, expensive, and difficult requirements to meet the fuel efficiency standards called the corporate, corporate average fuel efficiency standards, also known in the business as CAFE. Sure. Th this standard which is uh, uh, kind of complicated the way it's implemented, more or less requires all the automobile ma manufacturers to both improve the fuel efficiency of their entire fleet year by year, and also the fuel efficiency of their individual automobiles. Now, um, this standard, which moves the uh, what we call light passenger vehicles, everything but trucks, you know, light trucks, mm -hmm. up to about uh, 52 to 54 miles per gallon, and light vehicles, which are traditional sedans, to, let me see, I have a number on that here, to around 40 miles per gallon. That's impressive, SUVs. isn't it? I mean, but how do you reach that without spending a ton of money? So, so what has happened is, that's a really good question. So what has happened is, of course, the first way you reach that is, you quit selling sedans and start selling SUVs. So one of the reasons SUVs are very popular is they don't have as rigorous a fuel economy standard as sedans because they are viewed as light trucks. Mm -hmm. So that's why you see a lot of SUVs. Mm -hmm. The second part is to meet this standard, um, you can meet it many ways. You can produce a, a number of zero emission vehicles, uh, but those are turning to be quite problematical because the subsidies are slowly coming off, they're expensive, and there's a lot of consumer resistance. Something called range anxiety. Someone gets an electric car and they have range anxiety, so, and they're worried that they can't go far. It should work fine in Hawaii, but apparently people don't buy just electric cars in Hawaii. Uh, and then you could meet it with a, with a range of technologies. So the first thing is, if we want to go to the, but a, a, a final way you can meet this is by uh, increasing the compression of your automobile. You know, instead of producing a lot of electric cars or very advanced technologies, you can build a higher compression engine. But you can't build a higher compression engine with today's gasoline. You need a gasoline which has more additives in it, which resist what we call knocking. Or, you know, knocking is really when the chamber ignites before it should. And you hear this banging sound in your car mm -hmm. called knocking. So in order to achieve the higher CAFE standard, which is, you know, maybe in some ways very rigorous, maybe even too rigorous for yes. the existing equipment, you have to not only... You have to not only build an engine that's different to achieve the higher compression, but you right. also have to change the fuel and have a yeah. more refined. And this is where the politics fuel. come in it a little bit because 
The cheap way to meet the standard for the auto manufacturing is to build a higher compression engine because the other alternatives are very expensive. But that has an unusual effect. It makes the cost of gasoline quite expensive. Mm. And there might be <laughs> under different scenarios to meet the higher octane standard could easily lift gasoline prices anywhere from 25 to 50 cents a gallon. So actually the automobile manufacturers feel, well, we don't care. Let's let the refiners pay for it. But they're also a little concerned because if you sell a car whose only use can be uh, it has to buy the most expensive gasoline, people might not buy that car. Sure, sure. <laughs> I mean, you know, and it strikes me that the, if you have two directions to go here, uh, you know, assuming these new CAFE standards, um, you can get off CAFE completely and use electric. You can, you know, put your research and development. Yes, you can get lots electric. of CAFE credits in, under the government provisions or, to go electric. Or you can go to the higher compression and better right. quality fuel on the other side and it strikes me that, you know, I mean, here in Hawaii, we're all focused on clean energy, renewable energy, and, and ostensibly, or at least ultimately, um, electric cars. So if we put our investment into, into building a, a, a car with better compression and, and then finding better quality of, of fuel, we're going that direction instead of this direction. And it's a distraction from our stated mission of achieving renewable 100% by 2045. Yes, well, uh, unfortunately, uh, inexhaustible does it not necessarily mean inexpensive. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, this is the problem with these mandates and fixed goals that do not try to evaluate both, not just the benefits, but also the costs. And so I think the this octane paper that we did is sort of the final piece in this debate uh, there does not appear to be any cheap solutions to meet the fuel efficiency standard, which are now set for 2022. And oddly enough, the government behavior in implementing these standards backloaded them. So, if you look at the uh, if, you, if you look at the Slide on um, page 18. I don't know if you guys have that yeah, there. Let me but. look at slide 18 and see. The, yeah. I think that's really the critical one. If you look at that, you can see that if you go out to 2017 or 2018. Mm -hmm. The way the government wrote this is that you know politicians like to write regulations that don't occur during their term. This way, they don't have to explain why it's so expensive. So they, and if you look at, if you look at the cafe required versus the achieved miles per gallon, you can see that of this regulation, which is supposed to be finished by 2022, most of the heavy lifting is before us. See, the curves are quite steep. Mm -hmm. Those steep curves in achieving mile efficiency goals for each year's fleet it's going to be extremely expensive. Hence, EPA has taken back the Obama decision and is now spending a full year of something called the midterm evaluation to look at the CAFE standard and to see well, if it should be changed. That, wouldn't you? I mean, you know, from Trump's uh, you know, position on regulations and uh, things like CAFE standards and on everything that Obama did, He'd be looking to roll it back and uh, take the pressure. It might the be, contract. but the, the problem with this is that uh, this particular standard uh, has historically allowed some states to go their own way. Mm. But um, there's a huge benefit to the American auto industry to have a single standard. Yes. If you have multiple state standards, or California, New York have one standard, then the cost of producing automobiles for the non so-called less compliant and the more compliant states goes up in both cases because you beat down your uh, economies of scale. Mm -hmm. so, so most economists say that people the states like say, are, if you really think this is valuable, you should just put a tax on gasoline and let the consumers decide. Yes. Politicians don't like to do that. It might be efficient, but they like to hide the ball. And how you hide the ball is you pass a regulation 
and you tell everyone it's free, but of course it's not free. No. So, um, but I, I just want to get one thing straight, and that is that um, some states are making more ambitious standards, uh, re, uh, despite whatever the federal government wants to do in terms yeah, of. So the there was a provision standards. in the Clean Air Act. Right. This regulations are promulgated under a piece of legislation passed in the 1970s called the Clean Air Act. And the Clean Air Act uh, initially started with California seeking a special waiver to the law saying, look, the smog is so bad in L.A., we can't have the same standards as the rest of the country. Mm. So when they got a provision to meet local air pollution standards, and as we discussed in the past, so-called tailpipe emissions have gone way down. So if you take a 1968 Mustang, it produced about one ton of criteria pollutants for 100,000 miles. Still a great criteria car. Criteria pollutants are lead, sulfur, nitrogen oxide. Today's Mustang does 10 pounds. So the waiver that California is seeking, and which the Obama administration has not yet decided what to do about, is for climate, not for smog or air quality. But, as we've discussed many times, California will have no effect on the world's climate or the California climate. Mm -hmm. So this is a looming fight. Who should prevail? A single standard for the U.S. set by the federal government or local standards, which in this case are largely symbolic <laughs> and have no effect on climate, but mm -hmm. could be quite disruptive to the auto industry. Mm -hmm. So what, what is, what's the bottom line of the paper you presented? Uh, you know, the uh, bottom line of the paper I presented was that, well, I didn't present it, Max uh, Pazir, our downstream expert presented, was that, well, you've looked at electric cars, you've looked at all these other alternatives, and everyone was under the assumption that, well, this could be fixed with high compression engines, which are not that expensive, and higher octane fuel. But the bottom line of this paper is, uh-oh, higher octane fuel is very expensive. So that uh, stands in the way of, of, of a, a market the, process uh, to allow this to, to happen. You could either take, you could get the higher octane to the addition of ethanol, but you would have to put about 70% of the farmland in the U.S. and mm -hmm. divert it from food to, uh, you know, moonshine to use in automobiles. Or, you know, you can build a lot of re what's so-called reforming or isolation units, which are also extremely expensive. So building, the, putting that all together, Lou, you have, um, you know, the expense involved in, 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 make, in, in, in achieving these standards. And you have, on the other hand, the Trump administration and uh, Energy Department would like to um, reduce the standards. And then some states would like to maintain the high standards for their own environmental considerations individually, state by state. Where, <laughs> this is not an easy question, where is it all going to go? Uh, what, what is the consumer going to want to do? What is, the, what is Trump able to do? What are these states able to do? How are we going to reach a balance here? Yeah, so it's, it's a very good question, and uh, I would, uh, I so far have a very poor record of political forecasting, but I'm willing to stick my neck out. Once you again. always say that. Hopefully that your audience doesn't remember, but I think that uh, the, I don't think EPA, which is, is the agency in the federal government, which will really decide that, not DOE, I don't think EPA has decided what to do. They're spending this period to take it on. It's also a political decision. I would not put it past Trump to say in 2018, you know, I tried to issue a, a normal standard which would not kill the auto industry, but California and New York and their fellow travelers insisted on this higher standard, and that's why the auto industry is in trouble, and that's why you should kick out of office these senators from Michigan and Ohio. <laughs> I wouldn't put it past him to do that. <laughs> and if I were an advisor, I might encourage him to do that. But <laughs> I'm saying, this is a classic political problem we keep having in this country. We have these people who live in California, New York, who some might call elites, 
highly educated, they know what's better for everybody else, and they can be very disruptive, actually, to the traditional constituents of the Democratic Party, which are the workers in the auto parts. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I don't think this one is, this one's going to be interesting to watch. Well, it just, it, it comes to mind, uh, as, as we say from time to time, that energy and politics are inextricably intertwined, don't you exactly. think? Exactly. <laughs> Lou, let's take a, a short break. That's Lou Pugliarisi. He's the CEO of EPRINC, an energy policy research think tank in Washington, D.C. Here we are on Energy in America, and we're talking, among other things, about what you need to know about high octane, but we'll talk about other things now. Um, we'll talk about the energy research funding bill, which is also very important uh, for research and development uh, in clean energy. We'll be right back. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, which streams live on thinktechhawaii.com, uploads to YouTube, and broadcasts on cable OC16 and Olelo 54. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Aloha. My name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. Living in this crazy world So caught up in the confusion Nothing is making sense For me and you Maybe we can find a way There's got to be solution How to make a brighter day What do we do? We've got to give a little love Have a little hope Make this world a little better Try a little more Okay, we're back. We're live here on Energy in America on Think Tech, and we're talking to Lucian Pugliarisi. He's the CEO of EPRINC, an energy policy research think tank in Washington, D.C. And we've talked about, uh, you know, a paper they delivered uh, on octane and the implications of the uh, CAFE standards that are supposed to go into effect. And the question is whether they actually will. But now we'd like to cover another area, and that is the energy research funding bill. Uh, because this has an effect uh, on the development of clean energy around the country. Uh, so tell us about this bill and tell us its status, will you, Lou? Okay, so as you recall, or as you may not know, the, the United States government, largely through the Department of Energy, spends a great deal of money on something through an agency called the Advanced Research Project Agency-Energy. And this agency provides guaranteed loans for uh, cutting edge uh, demonstration facilities, factories. It's not a traditional way the government funds science, which is traditionally the government funds money in basic research, and then they, uh, that information, those findings are disseminated widely, and they allow the capital markets, entrepreneurs, to decide how to take that research and use it to make something useful for society, right? So, and the, and the standard thinking about that is that basic research, it really doesn't make sense for any individual company often to do it, but that there are huge benefits to disseminating those results broadly. Mm -hmm. But in the, and I'm not saying that's always the case, the government likes them, so, but under the Advanced Research Project Agency, they began to provide guaranteed loans for, like, automobile companies. For example, Elon Musk got hundreds of millions of dollars right, of guaranteed loans. Uh, a company called Fisker, which went bankrupt, got them. Uh, another company called uh, Solyndra. Do you remember Solyndra? Yes. Solyndra was a uh, manufacturer of solar panels, and uh, they went bankrupt in California. And so th this created a lot of uh, concern and, and, and among the Congress. Well, some people believe, like it's any sort of hedge fund or any kind of research, most of the projects were, were doing well, but others, and you have to have a few failures, right? The idea was you would expect some failures, but it was a big political fight. But, to, but to put it in perspective, though, Lou, this is not direct funding, right? 
This is yeah, not funding where the government just pays of one of these companies to do R&D. That the this government is... was picking winners and losers. This was the real part. Mm -hmm. So, the legislation is now, the Trump administration sent their proposal for funding to Capitol Hill. Congress tore that up and did their own work. And so, because they were the ones that are going to decide what we're going to spend. And so they have started on this. And they have already decided that, uh, for example, the Office of Energy Efficiency and Energy is going to see its budget cut from about $2 billion to $1 billion. That's a big cut. Our people at the University of Hawaii, I'm sure, are worried about this. They probably have some projects there. So that would be worth to look at to see how that. In addition, the. House of Representatives is going to completely zero out the Advanced Research Project Agency. They're going to zero it down to, uh, to nothing. I do believe the Senate won't have quite as onerous a view. They may try to put some more money into it. Mm -hmm. um, oddly enough, the Corps of Engineers will get a little bit more money. And I don't know if people know in Hawaii about this, but the Corps of Engineers is the basic agency that issues something called the 404 permit. And if you want to build a road or a pipeline or anything that crosses a so-called navigable water, which under the interpretation of the EPA is a puddle in the middle of your backyard, that you have to get a permit from the United States Corps of Engineers. Yep. And so there's lots of complaining that uh, getting that permit is very difficult, takes too long. So Congress is going to give them a bit more money. They're going to sort of keep the nuclear program constant. So this, inter this beginning of the budget process is quite interesting. It tells us where we're headed. And other members of Congress are also trying to increase or stabilize the budget for basic science research. So the fundamental, more conservative view is, okay, let's put money into basic research, maybe even more, but cut out the stuff of picking winners and losers. Yeah, so what, what does this mean, um, you know, um, to the, the, the people who are developing technology for clean energy? Because, I mean, in Hawaii, that's really a mainstream kind of thing. And, in fact, we have an energy accelerator here. Um, that you know is dedicated just to that kind of research and startup entrepreneurial you know uh, best practices uh, R&D. So so the question is uh, how much of that money that might have been funded uh, or guaranteed to these uh, startups who are doing research or these academic organizations that are doing research on, uh, on renewables. I mean, for example, we had a show last week about. Uh, HNEI's efforts, that's the White Natural Energy Institute efforts at developing fuel cell technology. And they're pretty well advanced. They have scientists here from all over the place. And I wonder if these changes, you know, in the funding bill uh, are going are gonna to affect them. So it would be good at some point to maybe do a program with them or to talk to them because fuel cells, fuel cell technology is heavily funded by Toyota. Uh, basic research grants in Japan, even in the U.S. Uh, some advanced, uh, even Aramco, the Saudi Arabian oil company, is doing a lot of uh, research in the U.S. on automobile technology. So, uh, you know, we have to look to each of these programs and see how much of this is based on federal money, how much is it based on state and private sector grants, and then finally, is it basic research or are they funding an enterprise? Mm -hmm. If you're involved in fundamental research to advance fuel cell technology and you're disseminating that research, I think those programs are not going to get hit that hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's, you know, because Trump himself and, and his, um, oh, I don't know, ideological uh, peer group, uh, they've said that they, they you know, they're not going to try to change climate change. They're you know, pulling out of the Paris Peace Accord and all that. And, and, that, and, the, and the flip side of that is they don't care too much about renewable energy either. And uh, I guess I have, I have some concern that um, that will filter down through the government, through the Department of Energy and everywhere else, 
and we'll see less research well, money for developing think, renewables. You know, there is a legitimate concern that um, uh, some of the funding is, and I don't want to resort wasteful, but it's not really directed at the most effective. Let's take something that's that, that's probably no one in Hawaii cares about, coal, right? Mm -hmm. Today, the camper carbon capture and storage coal plant, right, announced that it was shutting down. And the camper facility, which I think might be in in, in Texas, I'm, I'm not sure, Oklahoma, it, it's shutting down and it's going to be replaced by a gas facility. Now, um, is that a good or a bad thing? And my view is carbon capture and storage might be a good idea, but it's been, people keep trying to deploy it before it's ready because they get all this they either get feed-in tariffs from the local PUC or they get money from uh, from the government. But it, but it, the evidence is there that CCS is too expensive given the alternative fuels. So that's probably something it's time to kind of put a, you know, put a stake in it. It's done, you know. It's, mm -hmm. uh, we have to accept that everything we're working on is not necessarily going to make it. Yeah, well, absolutely true. But let me offer that uh, sometimes um, when you have a high-profile, high-priority project, and, and um, a lot of people in Hawaii feel that clean energy is just that, uh, you throw money at it. You know that it's not going to be totally efficient. Uh, you know there's going to be some slippage, some waste. Um, sure. but, but in order to solve the problem and move ahead, uh, you spend the money and try it out. You take risks, as as a business concern would take risks, in order to in order to move the needle ahead. I think and, if the government is going to take it out of the laboratory and deploy it as a commercial entity, mm -hmm. that should be a much different standard than basic research allows you to try a lot of different things. But if you're going to deploy it and build a constituency around that commercial enterprise. And it loses money year in, year out. I mean, here's the, the basic problem with, I'm going to send you some other information. These things work, but they don't get too expensive. But you cannot grow wind and solar with subsidies where the middle class has to spend $500 billion transferring money to the upper class. Okay? I mean, that's what sort of electric, that's why electric car subsidies have to go away, not because they're, you know, you, you can't keep spending money, but that the people that are taxed are going to stop giving you the money. They say, okay, fifty billion, I got that, but I'm not giving you Elon Musk five hundred billion. He needs to make this thing work. Okay. Oh, there's got to be limits on it for sure. There's but let me let me ask you this: it, all of that considered, uh, when you when you put together, you know, the the existing momentum, especially in states like Hawaii. And then you put in the new administration, and then you put in the sensitivity of funding bills and sort of the leverage of funding bills, how they can affect R&D going forward, both at right. government levels, at utility levels, and for that matter, private entrepreneurs. Um, what is going to happen here? Um, do you think we will have a slowdown in the development of renewables, or will it be just fine? You may have a slowdown in government support for renewables. But if the renewables are cost effective, I don't think you'll have a slowdown in there. I mean, look, if you can get the if you can get the uh, the customer base of Hico to pay for this stuff, why do you need taxpayers from across the country to send you money? Yeah, I suppose that's a big question, and and it's also a big question as to whether these guaranteed loans have worked so far, or sure. whether they've just been a drain on the uh, on the budget. So, I will tell you that if you look at the history of rooftop solar in Hawaii, it's not exactly covered in glory. I mean, there is a lot of money went down the tubes on that. Well, the good news is you'll be here in August. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I will come in and, 
in the studio directly. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, and, and I want to take you around and put you together with people who take you to every corner of the energy industry, uh, all the activities we can find, so completely expose you to everything that's going on. And a lot is going on, Lou. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm very interested. I'm very interested. <laughs> well, thanks very much. Uh, we'll oh, talk to you again you. in two weeks hence. Uh, and uh, Thanks for discussing these two issues with us. And we'll look forward to more uh, next time. Thank you so much. Lou Pugliarisi. Aloha. <laughs>